morning, Sunrise Bible Church. Yeah. Morning. morning, everyone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we're able to get together with our brothers and sisters here and study your word. And Lord, we ask that you bless AJ as he gives your word today, that it would change our lives, change our hearts and our minds for the things to come. Lord, we pray for your will be done in our lives, and we pray that we would learn what we need to this day, Lord. And Father, Thank you again that we have a church to go to. Thank you again that we have a book to read, Lord, that's more than a book. It's, it's, our, it's our manual uh, for life, Lord, and we are grateful for that. And Father, more than anything, we thank you for the ability to pray. And we, we will continue on praying, Lord, in faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you'd like to stand, let's worship. <laughs> Oh, all right. 
All righty, let's hear it for Rob and the Sunrise Singers. <clears throat> I, uh, <clears throat> I heard myself sing Happy Birthday a while back, and I said I will not ask Rob to be a part of his team, because I, I, I know what the answer would be. So there will be something for me to do, right? <clears throat> well, that first service, I was impressed. There was a lot of people here. I saw some new faces. I like to see that. And, of course, I saw some... No, I'm not going to say that. that would, I, I'm not going, I did not say old faces. <laughs> Familiar faces. See? One word makes all the difference. It can get you in trouble. Um, and I learned that. I know, I know Pastor Billy will be teaching soon on a marriage. And I know one word can get you in a lot of trouble. How many married people can attest to that? I is housebroken. <laughs> so we did have people from Canada and Arizona here. And I like the fact they're asking questions after the message because I'm teaching on Revelation. And it's just a topic you don't hear churches teach on. Only 2% of churches are touching on this. They don't teach it in uh, the cemeteries. I mean seminaries. <laughs> Other churches, pastors are not equipped. They don't understand it. They don't believe in it. Um, I was raised Catholic, so I didn't know much about that. In fact, uh, the Catholic Church, the position of the Vatican in Rome is they are amillennial, meaning they don't believe in a, a literal thousand-year kingdom that the book of Revelation chapter 20, where we're on, teaches on. And um, in fact, I had a little sheet here. It's been in my briefcase for a while. Um, I think now's the time to, to look at some of these notes here referring to uh, Catholicism. Um, basically, I don't know many of you who understand the, the language of Latin. I myself was Latin illiterate. But there is a reason why the Bible was taught in that language through Rome, Rome's support for a long time. As long as you had a Latin mass, there was no real need on the part of the church to make the Bible available in other languages. Huh, why? The Roman Catholic Church had no particular desire to have anyone reading the Bible, and even kept Latin copies for the use of only priests and certain lay people. Clever. Control the narrative, control the Bible. You decide what's in there that you want to talk about, what you don't. And unless they understand Latin, they're going to be pretty much in the dark. So we're blessed as a generation to have the Bible at our fingertips. We can download, we can get multiple Bibles, we can research and spend as much time as our hearts desire. When some people made translations without Rome's permission, Rome decided that was against the church. And yes, in prosecuting those who dared, if you dared to make a copy of the Bible, um, they routinely complained the Bible was keeping people from attending mass. So we need to control a narrative. We don't want to translate it and available. So they confiscated as many Bibles as they could they burned them. Wow. And uh, those who were involved in this distribution, the Lutheran movement, the Reformation period, those people that were involved in spreading the news, sharing the Bible, well, what do you think happened to them? Can we say 12 apostles? <laughs> um, they were persecuted, martyred, imprisoned, tortured, and killed. So aren't we blessed that we have this at our fingertips? When they finally made a translation into English, they still didn't want the people to read it according to the first printing's preface. So what are we going to talk about today? What's, what's going on in this world, this crazy world we live in? Well, let's see. Today's actually an anniversary, six months, for the Israel war with Hamas on October 7th. Six months have gone by. Um, I think the worst is yet to come from what I'm hearing, what I'm reading. Um, it's not over by a long shot. Look how long that war with Ukraine has lasted. I didn't think it would last this long. It's still going strong. A lot of money is being pumped into it for reasons. Follow the money trail. Um, and what else is going on? Uh, something big is going to happen. Big, big, really big, huge. Tomorrow, the eclipse. Oh, my gosh. Have you been following... <laughs> Have you been following the narrative on this eclipse that's going to happen tomorrow? Oh my gosh, you would think the end of days are here and the world's going to end and it's over because they're getting people feared, stoked up. And I know I spoke about the sun, the moon, the stars. Um, this is nothing new under the sun. 
Correction, it is the sun, so it'd be above the sun. <laughs> so when we hear about things that happen with the sun, the moon, the stars, I think that's covered in the book of Revelation in the tribulation timeline, which thankfully we don't have to be a part of. Why? Because we have a saving faith in Yeshua. So what we're going to do today is I want to talk a little bit about some church matters. We're going to continue to do a little short study on the um, armor of God. Uh, my wife was helping me with some slides, and I wanted to go into all of them. I wanted, and I have I broke them down sequentially. We're going to focus on one today before we get into Revelation chapter 20. We're going to talk about the millennium. And I was encouraged um, with some of the people from the first service who were asking questions saying, I've never heard it taught this way, or they just haven't heard it taught. And they had questions, and there are some things that are occurring in the millennial kingdom that is not commonly taught by people, but we have biblical support, chapters and verses. We're going to go over those. And we're going to spend the entire time today within that topic. I started it the last time I spoke, and we're still going to continue it uh, next time I speak. So um, we have a few chapters left in Revelation. I think I have about three or four more teachings, and I could finish it. And of course, I would be encouraged to hear your suggestions, your thoughts. If there's another book you would like me to unpack and dive into, I like to teach on more than the elementary level for those that are studying God's word uh, to get a deeper understanding of the Jewish idioms, the Jewish passages, the Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew words. And in addition to teaching myself, I like sharing the good news. So growing up Catholic, and they were all millennial, they didn't believe in a literal millennial period of a thousand years. They spiritualized it, allegorized it. They said it's not real. But I can assure you, anytime the book, the Bible, has specific numbers assigned to it, it's literal. It's not figurative. Okay? So this is something that should interest all of us. Why? Because I can give you a map. I can show you, give you directions how to get to the millennial kingdom. You want to be a part of that. But there's actually just a simple formula you have to do to enter this time period that the Lord has prepared for us. And it's a simple salvation message. Um, there's many passages throughout the Bible that tells one what, ne what one needs to do to be saved. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4, say it eloquently. You have to, it is through grace. What is grace? Unmerited favor. It's nothing you deserve, nothing I deserve, nothing I've done or you've done to get that. And you have contrary choice to accept it or reject it. It's your choice. Just like the angels, the finite number of angels that were created had that choice, and you saw what a third of them did. So you have to, through grace, have what? What's the big word here? Faith. Faith, faith is the word, folks. Have faith in who? Jesus and what he did. Now, historians show that he was a man who lived, he was tortured, crucified, killed. That's knowledge. And I grew up kind of like the, I consider myself a CEO. And what I mean by that is, you saw them last week. We had a holiday called Easter. I think I prefer the word Resurrection Sunday in lieu of it. But the CEOs showed up. You saw them in the seats next year. And those are the Christmas Easter only crowd. That was me. Uh, I didn't have Jesus growing up in the house. <laughs> His name wasn't mentioned. Um, we watched the Ten Commandments <laughs> at Easter, but that wasn't enough. To know of Jesus is not enough. To know, to have a relationship is the direction to go, and to know him better and grow in your walk with him. So what would happen if we actually were taught at a young age and had good role models and good parental authorities that taught us the good word early in our lives. What would that change the world? What would it be like? What would we be like? Well, let's take a look at this little video. So therefore, 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 devil, devil, you have no power. You have no power. Or authority. Or fire. Over me. <laughs> Because I am mighty. And I am powerful. And I am powerful. And I have the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And I am the moon of the Lord. <laughs> and I have glory. And I have glory. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
Gorinica. Gorinica. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Woo! She's like, you got that one. <laughs> awesome. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm so excited for you too. <laughs> because, because Jesus is coming soon. Yeah. Baby Jesus too. Yeah. Baby Jesus too. Yeah. And he's coming to get us. And he's coming to get us. And take us to heaven. And take us to heaven. And I'm going to be so happy. Glory to God. <laughs> so she's obviously a work in progress, as we are. But how many of you can join me in just raising your hands and say, yes, Jesus is coming soon. I'm so excited. And you didn't have to leave your seats, okay? So we have that message, yes. <clears throat> So in addition to the uh, CEOs I spoke about, I noticed in my mailbox, and uh, I mentioned this with the missus, um, a lot of churches in Nevada were asking for you to come join them for their Easter message. And what I was seeing in the pamphlets and what I saw in media was we have gifts for you, special gift. We have gift cards, a, a contest, a drawing will be held. We have daycare for your children. We have a special message for you, whatever that is. We have great music for you to listen to. And that was it. And I said to the missus, I said, I didn't see uh, sin mentioned. I didn't see Jesus mentioned. I didn't see resurrection uh, mentioned. Why do you suppose that is? And they want a short message, 25 years to tickle the ears. Well, I'm going to go a little bit longer, a few minutes perhaps, than the first service, but you want more than 25 minutes. I think that's why you came here. And I know how many churches I went to and didn't return back to. So you are among a group of two percenters that actually hear the book of Revelation being taught. Statistics showed in the past uh, holiday that we uh, um, surpassed, three out of 10 Christians attended services on that day. And of course, the churches were packed for those three out of 10 that showed up. But wouldn't it be nice if people were showing up like that all year long? It's not realistic, but, um, you know, we know it is what it is. And um, so anyway, we do have the um, hope that a lot of people don't know who, to have that hope in. And I want to uh, go over some church house announcements. We'll go into uh, the um, teachings of Paul with the armor of God, and then we're going to unpack a lot into the millennium, which I began the last time I taught. I'm going to continue it throughout this message and still into the next one. I have probably three or four more teachings on the book of Revelation. I think I will have about 30 teachings on it, and that's just skimming the surface. So if you listen to other teachers on it, you can get additional info, but hopefully I touch on areas that you haven't heard, that you're learning and growing as I do. And I'm also up for suggestions, um, not necessarily for other places to teach, but <laughs> I like this place, but <laughs> I know the state, they, the, the state in Alaska that would be happening. No, I would hopefully get suggestions or recommendations, other books you guys may want to have research and unpacked that we could go into and share. So I'm up for suggestions. Let me know. Already, There is an upcoming church announcement for a cruise coming for those who are the cruisers. That is not a picture of the captain of the ship. <laughs> he will be one of many teaching on the seven churches of Revelation. I think somebody else was talking about that at this church. And uh, it's uh, an opportunity to see beautiful places, to hear the good news. They'll be teaching on the ship, also on the destinations off the ship being joined by some of these people I watch regularly. I've talked with them. I've lunched with them. I watch their online teachings uh, twice a week. I learn they're, they're good teachers. Uh, Pastor Brandon Holdhouse, Rock Harbor Church. He has a new ministry called Tip of the Spear. So just like uh, this church has Get Life Media, additional information that teaches, helps insulate the church against lawsuits, 
we get striked, we get shadow banned. Um, I've experienced it where you get hits. So you want to proclaim the news. We have Mano Gonzalez with Prophecy Watchers. Um, I've actually read every single Prophecy Watcher magazine since they began four or five years ago. Wealth of information there. Ken uh, Michael of uh, Jan Markell's ministry and Pastor Tom Hughes, you'll be seeing him coming here later this year. So good opportunities. There's a barcode for you to scan. Uh, also, you have the ability to have home churches. I'm hearing people more telling me about uh, Bible studies they want to attend, uh, throw in a home church. Uh, it's a way to connect with your fellow neighbors, your family, co-workers, people that aren't saved, people that need to hear the good news that churches, unfortunately, are not giving them. There's an email address you can send that to, and that's available for uh, them to get back with you on and get you started. Also realize there's all these media platforms. You can listen to Pastor Billy Crone's messages. Um, also, there's um, a lot of censoring and shadow banning going on. So because of that, we have more than one platform. What I like to do is put things on jump drives for people. So if they miss a message or there's a strike given, there's other platforms they can watch. But people like to stay in a series and continue. So all of that 11 years of teaching he has is found on getalifemedia.com. Also, if you're so led, we have a couple of uh, black boxes in the back of the church where you entered. Uh, any donations that you want to give the church is appreciated. Um, if you're watching online, hello to my online audience. Thank you for participating and showing your interest in our church. And we uh, like to disciple with you, and we're happy to see you when you can come visit us. Um, there's a number on the bottom of the screen you can text for your donations to. We appreciate that, spreading the word, the good news. Also, don't forget, there's a Connect card if you're new here. Um, we like to just get a little information on you to answer your questions, fellowship, make you a part of the family, see you keep coming back here. And hopefully I don't scare anybody away <laughs> from uh, not wanting to come back. But we give good information, good teachings. We teach the full counsel of the Bible, all 66 books. And I'm going to go ahead and open up in prayer as we begin our message. Father, Lord, we're grateful to have a body of believers in the Remnant Church. We know they're declining. We know people are not coming like they used to. The Bible foretells these days. We are in the end of times. We're here for a reason. We're here for a season. And we're to be busy about the Father's business. May we bring others to a saving faith. May we grow ourselves in our faith. May we study the Word. That is how we grow in our faith, by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the Word preached, Father. And may we uh, become better disciples in our sanctification process. We have glorified bodies to look forward to. And we have the good news and revelation that we're given a special blessing of any other book that, that is separate, that for those who hear and read the words, we're given a blessing for those who partake in the study of revelation. So may our hearts grow, may our yearning for you increase, and may we be patient and have faith rest in your, resting in your words and not let the, the news and the media take us away from the good, righteous, saving faith that we have through Yeshua, our risen Savior. And all the church said, Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're going to go into our quick study, Word Safari, of the armor of God. You remember that. We had the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, the belt of truth, the shoes of peace. So what are we going to unpack today? The fourth piece, the shield of faith. I'm going to spend a few minutes on this before we get into the millennium. What is Paul talking about in Ephesians about the shield of faith? Well, basically, it's going to extinguish the fiery darts that come at us from who? Our enemy, the adversary. Realize 65% of professing Christians do not even believe in Satan. They don't believe he exists. So how can you deal with an enemy that you admit doesn't exist in your mind? Um, we are told we have a target on our back if we are followers of Christ. We are told we will go through tribulations, which is thalipsis in the Greek. We are not appointed to wrath, which is orge. So thankfully, you know, in, the, in our study, in our takedown of Revelation, Chapter 1 talked about John the Apostle on the island of Patmos. Chapters 2 and 3 covered the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. See, I got fingers I use for a reason. 
But only two churches were given accolades of praise from Jesus. All the others received separate condemnations. Uh, those two churches, of course, were Smyrna and Philadelphia. So Philadelphia is really the church you want to be a part of, but do we have an entire 100% Philadelphia church? You're going to have a mixture of all kinds. And just as in the days of Paul, all those churches existed in his times uh, that the Bible speaks about, just as they do today. It's a history or evolution of the church. Each had its uh, problems. We're told what to be wary of, what to watch for, and we're told what to focus on. So we are right now in the church age of Laodicea, which is a uh, teaching of apostasy, a separation of the truth. And let's get back to why we need the shield of armor to insulate and protect us from the enemies that are after us. So realize, first of all, the shield protects your whole body. Now, I can actually, I'm in a unique position. I'm going to talk briefly, famous last words. I know something about shields <laughs> because I got to use these <laughs> in my law enforcement career. I got to be uh, a part of the disturbance control unit. I was, I didn't volunteer for it. I was voluntold. Right. Follow me? So we were preparing for days of mass protests, civil unrest, lawlessness. That's off the charts. Uh, good thing we don't see any of that anymore. So we, as Paul talks about with the shield and the armor, we had to train. And it was monthly for months and months and months because they knew they couldn't rely on just a few people. They needed all hands available. We knew growing up watching the series Star Trek, everybody seen a few of those episodes? What does Captain Kirk tell people? Enemy is in front of you. We have an enemy in front of us named Satan. Shields up. Prepare. The darts are coming. Fiery attack is coming your way. Take the hit. Absorb it. But you don't give up. You hold on to the shield. So there I am in my helmet, holding my shield, nose level, shoulder to shoulder with people, holding the line, dealing with mobs of people. And I would give a command as squad leader, you know, uh, step back. We move as a line. Step back. We hold our territory. We don't give up ground. We disperse the crowds. We have flash grenades. We had stun, gun, uh, stun guns if needed. We, I would see the instigators, the hecklers in the crowd, people throwing Molotov cocktails, people throwing rocks, bricks, whatever was there. I would point them out. Those people would be arrested. What if somebody on the front line got assaulted, injured, or killed? There's a hole there, right? Well, they come in together, fill in that gap, and people on the rear come from the flank and survive. Paul is talking about how the Romans did things and how we as Christians have comparisons to our shield of faith and how it's to insulate us from attacks. So one thing I had to deal with that I'm going to show you a little video about this is um, you don't want to deal with this stuff. It's bad. It's called tear gas. That thing will shut you down. <laughs> Experienced it personally. Don't want to do it again. I'm glad I can now teach safely behind the pulpit <laughs> without having those elements, but it was for a purpose and a reason. These are the days of lawlessness we live in. We have an enemy after us. So basically the Roman soldier's shield, it was, came from a, a word known as thurios, which is derived from the word thura, which means door. So you're standing basically in front of a door. The door is about two feet wide and four feet high, and it's going to protect your life. The soldiers were smart. They would actually use leather because leather would be less prone, more resistant to heat, to fiery flames, fiery darts that Paul spoke about. And they would actually uh, wet the weather, which gives them extra added protection so that they would not burn from the arrows coming their way. So the shield was made of wood, had a central spine. There was a middle strip in the center of it, and it they did what they could to make it flame retardant. The Roman soldier's shield, as historians tell, tells us, they had fire arrows which carried a bulb filled with burning matter. And sometimes even the tips were wrapped in some sort of burning material that would be shot at their opponents. 1 Peter 4.12 actually tells us that the flaming dart of the devil comes as a matter of a test to purify us as Christians, and to fortify 
and strengthen our faith in Christ. The Roman soldier's shield uh, was to protect against the flaming missiles that the, was coming at them. They were always in a defensive position, and this was not done in passivity. It was said that this shield must be taken up. There is a reason they did that. It was called the turtle formation. Why did they have to do that? Because they were being attacked from all sides, not only the front, but up above. So they had soldiers holding that front line, and then you had your people back in the reserves with their shields that they could replace those that were injured or killed or cover themselves. Um, you're going to see a really neat video on this. So realize that not only does uh, this help the individual, but think what we could do as a body of believers if we all stood together in Christ, in unison, what an army that would be. Nothing is coming through. So here's a picture of different formations that the Roman soldiers dealt with. Here's a video that tells you, as we conclude this, what they were actually up against when Paul talks about the shield of faith. In ancient Roman warfare, the tortoise formation was a type of shield wall formation commonly used by the Roman legions during battles, particularly sieges. In the tortoise formation, the men would align their shields to form a packed formation covered with shields on the front and top, thereby forming an impenetrable wall. But was this formation effective during the battle? The tortoise was used to protect soldiers from all types of missiles, such as arrows and spears. It could be formed by immobile troops and troops on the march. The primary drawback to the formation was that because of its density, the men found it more difficult to fight in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and because the men were required to move in unison, thereby losing speed. The opponents of the Romans threw heavy objects from the walls, such as stones, logs, poured boiling oil on the turtle, to force the legionnaires to break the formation, and also sought to make the bridges slippery, on which the Roman soldiers climbed the wall. They say that the turtle was so strong that horses and carts could even pass over it. Anyway, but how did the tortoise form during the battle? The first row of men, possibly excluding the men on the flanks, would hold their shields from about the height of their shins to their eyes so as to cover the formation's front. The shields would be held in such a way that they presented a shield wall to all sides. The men in the back ranks would place their shields over their heads to protect the formation from above, balancing the shields on their helmets, overlapping them. If necessary, the legionaries on the sides and rear of the formation could stand sideways or backwards, with shields held as the front rows so as to protect the formation's sides and rear. This reduced the speed and mobility of the formation, but offered consistent defensive strength against opposing infantry and excellent protection against arrows and other missile attacks. Plutarch describes this formation as used by Mark Antony during his invasion of Parthia in 36 BC. Then the shield bearers wheeled round and enclosed the light armed troops within their ranks, dropped down to one knee, and held their shields out as a defensive barrier. The men behind them held their shields over the heads of the first rank, while the third rank did the same for the second rank. The resulting shape, which is a remarkable sight, looks very like a roof and is the surest protection against arrows, which just glance off it. Man, did you see that rolling stone of fire? I thought I was going to see Indiana Jones deck out of the way. Um, so yeah, Paul tells us we have a shield to protect us, but who essentially protects us beyond the shield? Jesus. He's our comfort, our joy, our savior. He protects us. And this past holiday, Resurrection Sunday, how often do you hear it taught at a church where when Jesus was crucified and he was on that cross for six hours, we hear about the stone being rolled away, of course. It was an empty tomb and it was sealed. Uh, Roman soldiers would pay for their life if that seal was broken. But the curtain was torn in half. Um, Herod's temple. So when I first read that in the Bible many years back, I thought, a veil, okay, is this like a, over a, bridal, a bride's face at a wedding, a veil? This veil was enormous in size. It was actually 30 feet wide. So if I look at this chair here and I'm going to my left, what, 30 feet distance-wise, that's a big veil. How high was it? 60 feet high. So now I'm looking way up high, 60 feet high, 30 feet wide, four fingertips thick, four inches thick. And how was it ripped? From the top to the bottom. You would need a team of horses on chariots like we saw in the video, going over the shields of the soldiers 
to rip that curtain. And it did not expose the Ark of the Covenant either. That was only in Solomon's temple. We're going to talk about future temples. <laughs> We're going to talk about the millennium. We're moving forward here. We're making progress. Okay, so realize in Ephesians 6.16, the shield of faith can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. We have nothing to fear. It's not like he's getting the best of us. When we bear that shield, Satan can cast all the slander, doubt, and dismay he wants, but it won't work. It'll be ineffective. And how does he also work at us? Through deception, fake news, sexual temptations, immorality, uh, drawing a life that's full of sin, leaving us vulnerable without our shield. So when you leave the house through the front door, or maybe you escape out a back door or side door, do you have your shield with you? Are you equipped? Okay, let's talk about the millennium. Is it a literal thousand years? I spoke about this in my, in my last teaching. We're going to spend the entire session on this and more into the next one. But uh, a lot of people don't. I talked about Catholicism. They're amillennialist. They do not believe in it. They believe it's uh, symbolic, allegorical. They do not see it as literal. But whenever numbers are used in the Bible, they are literal. Just like the uh, numbers we see in the book of Revelation for judgments. Um, chapter, chapters 3 and 4 in Revelation talked about the, um, I'm sorry, 4 and 5 talk about the heavenly throne, the 24 elders, and the opening of the scroll. Chapters 6 through 18 talk about the 21 judgments. We, we covered those. The seven seals, the seven trumpets, the sampit, seven bowls or vials, if you have the New King James Version. And the word church is mentioned 19 times in the book of Revelation. None of the church is mentioned in chapters 6 through 18, which is where the 21 judgments are. Why? We're not there. We're not appointed to God's wrath, to orge. We're not. We're taken out prior to that time. Chapter 19, we finished with uh, the return to Christ, the return of Armageddon. Then there was a 75-day preparatory period that Daniel speaks about. Uh, Daniel chapter 12 actually talks about Daniel, shut up the word, seal. It is not for you to know at this time. We have revelation that was written way later to continue and expand upon what Daniel didn't. But both books complement and continue each other in their teachings. And also all the Old Testament prophets in the Bible only spoke up to the period of the messianic kingdom, the millennial kingdom. They never spoke about the new heavens and the new earth, which the New Testament talks about in the book of Revelation. So here you had to endure all the judgment, righteous judgment of God's wrath with all the judgments. Now the remaining chapters of Revelation, this is exciting stuff because this is something we all get to partake of. And, you know, you think about how old you are now. Some of us feel old. Our bodies are wearing. We're ready for a glorified body, a sinless body, right? But we get the aches and the pains, and we see hospital bills and pharmacies and prescriptions and medication, and we're tired of it all. We want a new eternal body, and you're going to have that in the millennial kingdom. And it's a literal thousand years. So if you, if you think you've been around a lot now, maybe in your 80s or 90s, that's nothing. We're told that if you die at the age of 100, you're like an infant, a child. So think what you could do in a thousand years. And why do we have to have a millennial kingdom? That is a good question that a lot of people ask. It's like, wait a minute. So we, we win the tribulation war. We come back with Jesus. Armageddon's over. Why couldn't we just stay up in heaven when we were raptured? And we have more faith and in indicators and signs of this generation to be a part of that rapture generation than anyone before us. Only God the Father knows when that will be. But we can discern the times. We know the days we live in. We know we're at the end of times. It's comforting that a lot of the pastors and teachers that I follow believe it will be in our lifetime. No reason not to believe that. But time will tell. Anyway, um, we're going to talk about the reasons for a millennium. And there's the reasons we have to come back. And it has to do with the fulfillment of the covenants. How many covenants do we have in the Bible? We have eight. We have the Adam Edenic, Adamic, Noahic, try to pronounce that one, Abrahamic, Mosaic, Land Covenant, Davidic, and the New Covenant. So let's break down some of those. The belief in the Messianic kingdom is twofold. 
the unfulfilled promises of the Jewish covenants and also the unfulfilled prophecies of the Jewish prophets. Realize Isaiah is the most quoted and referenced prophet in the Bible. And you know which book in the Bible is the most referenced of the 66, don't you? Genesis. So let's unpack this. First, we have the Abrahamic covenant. And what it does, it promises the eternal seed developing into a nation that would possess the promised land. Has that happened? No, it's yet to be fulfilled. The second is the land covenant, which spoke of a worldwide regathering of the Jews and repossession of the land following their dispersal. So the Jews have physically inhabited the land. They're physically there, but they have not been spiritually redeemed. Paul the Apostle tells us, as Gentiles who are grafted into the tree, do not think of yourself better than the Jews who rejected the Messiah. They went to unbelief. They are to repent. Metanoia, have a change of mind. Go from unbelief to belief in Yeshua. And it's our job to bring them there, and we get to join them into the Messianic kingdom. All right. The third is the Davidic covenant, and it promised four eternal things, an eternal house, a dynasty, an eternal throne, an eternal kingdom, and an eternal, eternal person. And we know who that person is, our Savior. Fourth is the new covenant, which spoke of the national regeneration and salvation of Israel. They have not been there yet. They're coming there. They need to go there. Daniel, 70 weeks. We've only had 69 transpire. There's a pause. There's the remaining seven weeks that are unfulfilled. It's for the salvation of the Jews to bring them into belief. And we only uh, had 490, 483 of those 490 days fulfilled. So we, we know that's up, future, and coming. Um, so we have a final fulfillment for a final future kingdom. These are the reasons why we can't just stay in heaven. We, <laughs> we have to have an eternal, a literal uh, thousand-year reign. And the conditions and what it's going to be like, you're going to be excited when you hear this. It's going to be similar to Edenic conditions. And um, whenever you hear people or pastors, teachers on the book of Revelation and again to the millennium, there's a couple areas that they don't uh, commonly speak about, but we have a lot, not just one verse, a lot of scriptural support. And it covers two areas, and that is the sin nature. Is it there? Is it not there? And who does it apply to? Um, I had somebody in the first service ask me as a uh, raptured saint, would we have a sin nature? To which I said, no, we won't. We'll have glorified bodies but there's other groups of people that will be in that millennial kingdom. So we're going to talk about that at a future time. But the other thing people will not understand, or maybe wasn't taught, in the millennial kingdom, is there, drum roll, is there animal sacrifices? No. Yes, no? Yes. Wow, we got a mixture here. Yes. And you know what? The yeses and the noes, they can't both be right. All right? Oh, I'm right. What does Scripture tell us, tells us about that? We're going to talk about that. All righty. So the unfulfilled Old Testament prophecies serve as the basis for the belief in the millennium, folks. Now we're going to talk about one of the most referenced prophets, the most referenced prophet in the Bible, Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 1 through 5. There shall come from a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord. People don't fear the Lord today. And he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with a rod of his mouth. We are told Yeshua will rule with a rod of iron. He will deal with the sin nature quickly and efficiently, not like today's legal court system that drags out for years. Okay. Um, 
and with the breath of his lips, he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins and faithfulness, the belt of his waist. So here in Isaiah 65, 20, King James Version, we are told there shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die. What number? A hundred years old. But the sinner, being a hundred years old, he will be accursed. So what is this telling us? Basically, and the way I uh, remember it quite fairly easily is, you have a hundred years to figure out if you've accepted or rejected Messiah, who is ruling the throne while you're alive in the millennial kingdom. You have a hundred years to decide because as a believer in your eternal glorified bodies, you're, you're sticking around forever. You're not going to experience, you're not giving into marriage. You're not giving into uh, procreation and you'll have a resurrected glorified body. You will not be making the pharmacies rich with your medications. <laughs> so also interesting point for note takers. There is no resurrection of millennial saints within the millennial kingdom. So that tells us it's the accursed and it's the non-believers that die. The believer does not. That's good news. So the millennium is Christ's rule on planet earth. Christ will rule with a rod of iron under an absolute monarchy and only unbelievers will die. There is no resurrection of millennial saints within the messianic kingdom. Here's a little video of a preview of what to look forward to. Does that sound better than the state of Nevada? No comparison. And so we're not going to be playing harps on clouds? Nope. Okay, let's move forward. Life in the millennium. What were the conditions going to be like? 
Well, don't just take AJ's word on it. We have chapters and verses for you to peruse, to be a Berean, to dig deeper. I can't just teach Revelation and stay within um, the first few verses of chapter 20 without unpacking it with other verses, other books in the Bible. Um, we probably will not be able to, in chapter 20, get to the, uh, the book of life, which all of us are in, uh, the Lamb's book of life, which you want to be in, and the great white throne judgment. Who goes there? What's that all about? Probably won't get to that today, but you'll come back, I hope. So anyway, they will be earthly priests in the future temple. They will be positional authority within the millennial kingdom. Just as there are degrees of positional punishment for the non-believer at the great white throne judgment, there's positional authority and rewards for those within the millennial kingdom. How do we get those? By what we do now with the season of our life for the time we're given. And we don't know how much that time is. You know, we're all in different time clocks. But what you do now to advance the word, to occupy until it's coming, to wait for the master to come home, to look for that crown of righteousness where you're looking for his appearing as that little girl in that video did, her parents taught her. Yeah. So what you do with the time you have remaining, bringing people to, to Jesus, telling them about the Messianic kingdom, the Bible is true, the prophecies that have been fulfilled, the ones that are yet to fulfill. It's all within your realm and an ability. If you get outside of your comfort zone and reach the lost in your families, in your communities, uh, you know, you got to kind of step out of your comfort zone. You don't think I'm outside of my comfort zone right now? Huge, big time. But there's a reason in the season of everything that happens in our life. I don't believe in coincidences. And I think we have a purpose and a destiny each of us to fulfill. So may we be encouraged to pursue those. And I'm encouraged with the Bible studies that I'm hearing and the groups that are doing, the home churches, um, because they can't find churches that are close to where they live or maybe um, they're handicapped or there's just no good teachings. And you won't know that unless you study the word yourself. And you have to listen to other teachers. And what if you have two good teachers that you really like and you're just really learning a lot from them? And they're highly recommended and people talk about them in the church. And did you hear so-and-so's message today? I did. And, and what if they both talk about the same thing? And what happens, like, not that this ever happens, what if they disagree? <laughs> what? They're talking about the same thing and they have different opinions? Who's right? Who's wrong? It's for you, the Berean. You research, you study scripture. You find out which teacher is a little bit off, a little bit off. Or maybe you just don't care, but hopefully you do. So anyway, moving along, there will be universal prosperity. You won't have the pinching of the middle class that we're experiencing with the rich and the, and the broke, the oppressor, the oppressed. There'll be universal equity, prosperity. Human life obviously is prolonged. We talked about that. You think you've lived a long life now, or maybe you've had a few kids and you feel like they've taken the life out of you, but you got a thousand years <laughs> and you're going to be having fun what's been prepared and made ready for you. There will be an increase of light. Well, obviously, you heard the Shekinah glory. Christ is going to be there. That's going to increase the light a lot. We're going to have changes in the animal kingdom their natures will change. So I don't know about you, but I have a health, I have a fear, fear, uh, healthy respect. I have a healthy respect for animals that are at the zoo, behind bars, behind glass. I think it stemmed from the time when I was a young child uh, circling my block, uh, sh glad to show my independence from my parents that I could ride a bicycle, didn't need dad pushing me, I can do it on my own. And I get to the other side of the block and on the front porch are two full-grown Doberman pinchers. And they got my attention, and I got theirs. And I'm pedaling, pedaling faster, and I see them leaving, coming towards me. And I also notice that they're not on a leash. <laughs> oh, so I'm pedaling faster and faster, and guess what? It's like trying to outrun a kitten in your household. You can't. <laughs> they're going to get you. So that fear that we have of animals in the millennial kingdom will be gone. Now, we will have love, joy, and righteousness, just as we don't now today. We'll have abundance of it. Look at all those passages. Isaiah really cranks it out there. Great book to study. 
plenty of rain and water. There will be no bioengineering, chemical chemtrails, cloud seeding, manipulation of the weather affecting our health. No man-made sinful activity in those realms. There will be plenty of trees, grass. Uh-oh, this part's going to get Pastor Billy excited. This is what he harps on. Cattle. Oh, yeah, he's going to have his picture taken with the cattle. He'll be on a cow. Uh, he'll be friends and buddies with many of them, but I think he has a hidden purpose, an agenda, why he wants to snug up to them. So there'll be uh, sheep. <laughs> there'll be gold and silver and other material blessings. So uh, even Amos talks about that. He wasn't just talking about those cookies, right? Okay, still with me here, good. Now, what kind of government are we going to have in the millennial kingdom? I mean, we're not floating on clouds, stringing, stringing harps along, we're going to have a government, a form there. What does the Bible tell us about that? Well, there's actually going to be two forms of government. We're going to have one that's called the Jewish branch. Well, let's see. The Messiah was Jewish. The authors of the Bible were Jewish. Jewish history, Jewish idioms. It kind of makes sense. It'd be Jewishness, a government, a hierarchy, a hierarchy, a government with Jews. Yeah, there's going to be a Jewish branch. Also... Who but David will serve as their king. I can't wait to meet the guy. Oh my gosh, I've read so much about him. He will serve as king over Israel and also as a prince. Pretty nice title to have if you're David. But remember, David will be under who? The king, King Messiah. King of kings, Lord of lords. Nobody serves that. Also, the 12 apostles. We read about them in the Bible. Uh, they have a specific task, assignment, a ministry, duties, responsibilities, and they will have authority over the 12 tribes of Israel. Matthew tells us that. Also, the princes, unlike today's government, the wokeness, they will rule in righteousness. And we know when we've been oppressed. We know when we've been taken advantage of. We know when we've been lied to. Not then. We will have judges and counselors. So you can see there's going to be different positions. People will occupy for different purposes. Also, Israel, this is a note to take. People don't always mention this part. They will be head over the Gentiles. Really? Yeah, Deuteronomy tells us that. And it actually says in that passage, no nation will rule or be above Israel. So that puts them in the driver's seat. Okay, now we have the 12 apostles. You remember those fellows. Simon Peter is there, his brother Andrew. James and John, the sons of thunder, the sons of Zebedee and Salome. Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas. The lesser James of Alphaeus. Thaddeus, or Jude, as he likes to be called. Simon the Zealot is there. I don't see Judas of Iscariot. Why? He got replaced by who? Matthias. Matthias. Right. So these 12 amigos, Luke tells us in chapter 22, but you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I will bestow upon you a kingdom, millennial, just as my father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So you see where they're going to be utilized and busy. They will be involved with the 12 tribes of Israel. Now we are told in Ezekiel, my servant David will be king over them and they will all have one shepherd. They will follow my laws and be careful to keep my decrees. Key word there, careful. Why is careful there? It's for a reason, right? God put that there. That's because there are those who will not follow his decrees. Realize in the millennial kingdom, you're going to have different groups of people. You're going to have those who survive the tribulation, all 21 judgments. You'll have saved and unsaved. You'll have Jews and you'll have Gentiles. You'll have believers that will be martyred. Those that are martyred, those that are raptured in the church get glorified bodies that are sinless. 
but you will have mortal bodies enter into the millennial kingdom. Now, only the believers enter the millennial kingdom. The unbelievers that survive their mortal bodies will be cast into judgment later on at the great white throne. But the believers who survive the judgments, and there will be, they get to go and repopulate the plant of the millennial kingdom. And they are born and repopulate with what in the blood, the sin nature, it's not removed. Remember, animal sacrificed removed, um, no, covered the sin. That's all it ever did is covered the sin. Who actually removed the sin? Jesus. Hosea 3.5 tells us, Afterward, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. And we also will not have cell phones in the millennial kingdom. <laughs> Scripture doesn't tell us specifically, but I'm hoping we have better ways to travel and communicate, and we won't be constantly texting everybody to death. Nobody calls on the phone anymore. <laughs> okay, we're going to have better system of government in place. So we have a Jewish branch as one type of government. What's the other kind that we're going to have? Gentile, correct. The judgment seat of the Messiah will examine your works for positional authority within the kingdom. Our works do not save us, but what we do because we're saved and what we do afterwards gets you positional authority. There are five crowns you could earn. We covered that in previous messages. This will include those who have been martyred under the fifth seal in the first half of the tribulation. Also are those who did not worship the Antichrist, nor receive the mark of the beast within the second half of the tribulation when the mark is instituted. We will also have, yay, look around yourself, rapture church saints. Psalm 72 speaks of different Gentile nations to be ruled by kings who will be supreme rulers over what area? Their own nations. Interesting. And within the kingdom, you will have Messiah who will reign over everywhere, the entire planet, all the earth. And he will have help in him, kings, who will be delegated areas of responsibilities. So if you're not busy now, you're going to be busy in the millennium. And you may not even need to sleep. Think how much you'll get done. <laughs> and eating and your bodies. Oh, my gosh. We could, we could go there. Now, how are we doing on time? We're doing good. Here comes the hot, debated topic Animal sacrifices. Does that happen? Does it not? What do they teach? Some say yes. Some say no. Everybody can't be right. I'm sorry. Some of you will be wrong. <laughs> what does scripture tell us? Well, what does it say? Ezekiel 43, good book and chapter to study. After our Lord has finished building his fourth millennial temple, so... Who's building that fourth millennial temple? Jesus. Oh my gosh. Knowing how good he is, how perfect he is, how righteous he is, I'm thinking this is going to be the best temple ever built. Solomon did a good job with the sparse few coins he had. No, he had a multitude of wealth, uh, billions in today's days, uh, in those times, to build a beautiful temple that actually housed the Ark of the Covenant. It stopped at that point. The Jewish people are trying to do what? Build a third temple. Did God ask for it? No. Will the abomination of desolation occur within that one? Yes. And there's going to be a fourth temple built by Jesus himself. And that passage, and a lot of times people who don't understand this, and I'm going to be particular and specific here, will say, no, that's not right. That's reference to another temple. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Very clear, detailed instructions are given here. So it gives instructions as to the animal sacrifices to be offered. It will be those from the lineage of Zadok, a faithful remnant who comes from the tribe of Levi. I would suggest you give Ezekiel chapters 44 and 45 a study. It goes deep into this, not just a few verses, chapters about the millennial temple, about millennial sacrifices being made. 
objections, and, and this is something that you have to address because people are like, wait a minute, no, no, it's, that was under the Mosaic Law. Animal sacrifices are done with. The Jews are still doing it, but that's not for us. I understand that. Uh, objections have been made that once Jesus Christ came, he made the perfect sacrifice for sins, past, present, and future. Absolutely. And they'll say no further need for animal sacrifices need to exist. That is the argument you're going to hear, and that's not uncommon to hear that. Remember, animal sacrifices never removed the sin. It just covered them. Jesus removed the sins. So most premillennial scholars, and we are premillennial, this church, state that the purpose of animal sacrifices will be memorial. That's the key word, folks. If you're taking notes, memorial in nature and serve as object lessons for the sinner that sin was and is a horrible offense against God. This will not compete nor replace what Jesus did on the cross. So why are the animals still involved? What do we have in the millennial kingdom? Sinners. And with sinners comes sin. And that has to be dealt with in a memorial. So we have reasons for these sacrifices. One, it will serve as a memorial to the death of Messiah, a physical ceremony for Israel. As communion functions and serves the church, we had that on Resurrection Sunday a week ago. It'll be to remember the body and the blood of Jesus. It'll provide a means of restoring fellowship to, for the millennial saint. The Old Testament saints were saved, like us, by grace through faith. It'll provide ritual cleansing. The Shekinah glory will be within the Holy of Holies of the millennial temple. One cannot approach without the cleansing of impurities to not defile or to pollute the temple itself. These sacrifices pertain to the privilege of life and blessing in the kingdom. So, Jeremiah 3, 16 tells us, And it shall come to pass, when ye multiplied and increased in the land in those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more, The ark of the covenant of the Lord, neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done any more. So the Ark of the Covenant was last in Solomon's temple. There's theories and speculation where it currently is. Uh, we can't stand on any support for that. The Jews say they know where it is and they'll put it in the third temple. Time will tell. I'm not convinced. So of the sacrificial system, realize the animal sacrifices will not, and I repeat, will not be a reinstitution of the Mosaic system. The millennial temple passages cited are the following. The sacrificial system passages cited are the following. Research, be a Berean, interesting. I think a few eyes opened up a little bit, but don't just take it on AJ's word, take it on the authority of scripture. So the future animal sacrifices will not deal with eternal salvation, but rather with finite cleansing of impurities from everyone who survived the great tribulation. They will be the ones in the mortal bodies with a sin nature. And the children born to them, there's going to be repopulation in the millennial kingdom during the thousand year reign of Christ. Those born will still have to trust Christ in order to be saved, just as we did prior and are in our glorified bodies. Some questioned why the glorified saints who return with Christ in his second coming are able to reign with him. One reason is because the glorified saints of the millennium will no longer have the sinful Adamic nature as part of their being. I'm excited about that. No more sinful thoughts, no more sinful nature. We're in a glorified body. They will be able to rule and have perfect judgment. Why? Because sin is gone in them. Jesus promised that if we overcome in this life as believers, he will give us authority to rule over nations and have authority over others. And here's a good chart that talks about the differences between the Mosaic sin offering, what it covered, and the kingdom, millennial kingdom offering. The Mosaic way, the altar was anointed, not in the kingdom. The Mosaic system demanded a sin offering in the form of a bullock for all seven days. In the millennial kingdom, it demands a bullock only on the very first day. In the Mosaic system, no goat was offered 
in the millennial kingdom, goats will be offered when? In the last six days. The Mosaic sin offering had blood applied to the horns of the altar on the four corners. In the um, Messianic kingdom, the blood will be applied on the horns, the corners, and the lower molding roundabout. So I think when we continue this teaching, next time, time runs out, time goes faster when you're having fun, we will pick this up and continue the millennial teaching. I hope you found this uh, enlightening. Hope it reaffirmed some of your beliefs and maybe changed a few. Anyway, I'm going to close in prayer. Father, we give you the glory, the praise, the honor. You are worthy. You are holy, 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 righteous, and just. May we be encouraged by your word. May we delve deeper into it. May we share the joy we have. When we get uh, <clears throat> concerned with the affairs of the world, that's temporary. May we focus on what you prepare for us in the millennial kingdom. And may we share this good news and bring others to Christ through it. We thank you and praise you through our risen Savior, Jesus. All the church said, Amen.